Welcome to episode two of Keeping It a Hundo. I'm your host, Matty Hundo. Thanks for listening to episode one, Clean John. I was pleased with the reaction, and John was overwhelmed with the reaction. So thank you for that. Episode two is a conversation with former Big East basketball great Terry DeHair. I apologize in advance for the sound quality. We recorded it at a bar in Jersey City, New Jersey, Terry's hometown. I promise it won't happen again, so try to bear with me through the growing pains. Also, continue to download and subscribe to Keeping It a Hundo on the Apple Podcast app and rate and review after you listen. A lot of listeners have been having trouble figuring out how to rate or review, so feel free to message me and I'll help you out. So enjoy episode two. Terry DeHair. Terry played at St. Anthony's on the number one high school team in the country under the famed coach Bob Hurley. By the time he left Seton Hall, Terry was the Big East all-time leading scorer. He was then drafted in the first round by the Clippers and spent seven years in the NBA. Jersey City has always been a big part of Terry's life. He donated 75 grand to the park he grew up playing at as a kid to help fix it up. He was also elected to the Jersey City Board of Education. Growing up in the suburbs of Boston, I was a hoop junkie. I played year-round. I couldn't get enough of it. In fact, it was so bad, my girlfriend in middle school broke up with me because, and I quote, you'd rather have sex with a basketball than with a girl. I took it as a compliment, and when I wasn't playing, I was watching. Besides the Celtics, the Big East was the pinnacle for a kid in the Northeast. I had a lot of favorite players, but Terry DeHair was at the top of a short list. So February 1993, I was 15 years old. Uh oh. Snowstorm had just hit Boston, and I'm in I'm in I'm in my house watching St. John's play Seton Hall at MSG. Okay. I watched you drop 41 at MSG that day. I then went outside, shoveled the snow. <laughs> Chipped away some ice and started shooting up jumpers imitating Terry the head. I shoveled a lot of snow to shoot jump shots. I'm sure you did. <laughs> that was common practice in, in, in Jersey City to to uh anyone that knows the area, Garfield Park, where we grew up, they know that it was nothing that uh could stop me from actually getting up a few jump shots, whether it was snowing, raining, we would shovel like uh, maybe like just 12 feet of snow out the way, and we, we will play within the paint area during the snowstorm. Uh, we'll figure it out. Grew up in Jersey City. Oh, born yeah. Born and raised there? No, I was actually born in Harlem. Born in Harlem. Born in Harlem, moved to Jersey City at probably at age five. Uh, then uh, my, you know, my father came over from New York, from Harlem. He was a super. So I guess he put his name in for uh, a superintendent job, you know, and Jersey City called him. And then we had to move from Harlem to Jersey City. He was uh, basically a superintendent of uh, Arms and Garden Projects, where I grew up, which just happened to have a basketball court across the street. Perfect. Perfect, you know. My father actually, you know, being West Indian uh, from Trinidad, uh, you know, the favorite love, the favorite sport is uh, soccer, you know. Of course. So uh, I, I can recall back then he was trying to actually show me how to play soccer, like as a youth. Like he bought me a soccer ball. He would uh, kick the ball to me. And it would, it was funny because I always pick it up. You know, I, mean? I, I, I couldn't use my feet that well. I'd pick it up. And then it was some guys in the neighborhood that just would always play basketball. And I just, you know, I think that's why I actually gravitated to that sport because all the, all the little kids in the area were playing. So I decided, you know, that soccer wasn't something that, you know, I wanted to use my hands. When you were a kid, was was Jersey City known for who? Did they have good teams at St. Anthony's at that point? Yeah, at, at that point. I don't know how far back the history goes. Yeah, at that point, St. Anthony's, uh, 
when I was, let's say, as a freshman in high school, St. Andy's had already won over 20 uh, state titles. So it was uh, it was a fixture in the city. You know, basketball was known in Jersey City. We had some great players that came Before out of you, Jersey City. The one guy I remember hearing about was David Rivers. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, That was one guy I I, my, I remember as a, a being a young kid uh, going into a pizza place and seeing David Rivers. Uh, he was ordering a pizza. And I can remember, like, looking at him and every single thing he did in the pizza place, like, this is the great Dave Rivers. Like, how he put, you know, garlic on his pizza, <laughs> how he, you know, walked out the door. How he, and because being as young, you only hear the stories. Like, he was so big that he was almost like a, a living folktale. For the yeah. listeners, David Rivers was a point guard at St. Anthony's, ended up in Notre Dame, played for the Lakers for a little bit. He was drafted uh, in the first round for the Lakers and played overseas a number of years, you yeah. know. Ambassador for Turkey and Italian basketball now, you know. So he, he, he was like great history growing of up. Basketball. Great history yeah. of basketball. He was the deal. Well, we'll say the deal growing up, you know what I mean? And everyone wanted to emulate that, you know. It's funny you talk about imitating everything you saw him do. I remember <laughs> growing up in my area, there were a couple guys and one of the guys everybody looked up to was Rick Brunson. Right. He comes from, he played from my rival high school. Yeah, Rick is a, I know Rick well. His son plays for Villanova now. He was always a little younger than us, you yeah. know, covered up. But he was always steady. Yeah. He was always there, you know what I mean? Yeah, I remember Rick. Good guy. And Rick, Rick wore champion basketball shoes in high school. <laughs> so I got a pair of champions. And I wore champion <laughs> kicks for one season. And I said, I can't wear these anymore. <laughs> Went back to my Nikes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that, it's so funny that people don't understand that how, like, older guys or people that play basketball, they don't understand how they affect un- younger kids. Like, like when I can remember the first day I, I decided that I wanted to play basketball. We were playing in the streets, and we were playing uh, wiffle ball in the streets. And it was a group of kids, maybe about maybe 15 to 20 kids that walked by, but they were headed to a basketball court. And I didn't understand the commotion, but they all were going to see this guy play. Wow. All these kids are stopping what they're doing to go see this guy Mua play? Who the hell is Mua? This guy Mua is a guard from the neighborhood, older cat. This is just out in pickup game. This pickup game. So then they had a little summer league going on. So I said, so everyone was flocking to the court. So I'm like, wow. So I go to the basketball court and like, I see this point guard that's amazing to me. Like, it's the first time I've ever seen a guard on a fast break two-on-one cuff the ball, put it behind his back, fake the guy out and lay the ball in, and the place goes wild. And I'm like, wow. He just cuffed the ball behind his back. I've never seen it before, done, ever, TV, you know, in the streets, anywhere. He cuffs the ball, lays the ball up, and he's talking smack. Like, he's, he's talking to the other team. He's talking to the other coach. He's talking to the other team's bench. And I thought that was amazing. And and what I did, and right then I said, you know, right then and there I said, you know what? I want that. That's what I want. I want people to run. I want people to say, yo, that kid's playing over there now. You know, let's go see him. Let's go watch him. It was just electricity in the hood that day that was just amazing. And I thought that that's a good thing to do. So from that point on, I always have my sights on being, I wanted to be that guy. But how can I, how can I, how can I be that guy? I don't even know how to play basketball. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was funny, like, I didn't even play. <laughs> like, the father or a uh, uncle or someone that played basketball before. I'm West Indian, first generation. No one ever played sports. My father didn't even know what basketball is. As far back as you remember, Seeing that, I always wanted to play basketball, but I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know, I didn't have like an AU team, or I didn't have someone like a scout or somebody say, do this. I wasn't tall, I wasn't a big guy, so I wasn't strikely, I didn't say basketball on my forehead when you see me. How did you meet Bob Hurley Sr., or was it Bob Hurley Jr. you met first in school? How did you meet the Hurleys? Well, well, basically how I met the Hurleys, I had a, a guy that uh, lived across the street from me that actually played uh, for St. Annie's High School and he was winning state championships across the street he was a guy on the block that we all looked up to Miles Dixon 
Miles Dixon played at St. Anthony's. He's very good. He's a very good street ball player. And we all looked up to him. And he went to St. Anthony's. And and, uh, and two other guys that were uh, a little older than me, they went to St. Anthony's and played basketball. So it was the notion on Randolph Avenue, Garfield Park, if you're pretty good, you follow the path to go to St. Anthony's. So... I never really thought about St. Eddie's coming up because I wasn't really that interested in basketball. I wasn't that good. I, I think I started playing in the eighth grade. I, I, I played in my first, like, actual team where I actually put on a uniform. I was a part of the St. Patrick's School eighth grade team. Yeah. And it was just so funny that Bobby Hurley Jr. now at the time, he was playing in the same league, but he was playing with Our Lady of Mercy on the other side of town. But he was also playing in the eighth grade uh, a grammar school team which is Catholic. Uh, another person which you might know is Jerry Walker. Sure. Jerry played with him at Seton Hall. Played with him at Seton Hall. Yeah. He played for Assumption or Saints. That was another grammar school team that was Catholic. So in the eighth grade, we will play against Bobby Hurley, St. Pat. St. Pat's will play against OLM. We will play against Assumption of Saints. And those are like the three big games. So at this point, are you even the best guy on your team? No. You're just one of the guys. I'm just one of the guys. I'm happy. Right, you're fitting in. I'm, I'm fitting in. Right. I'm happy to, you know, people could talk about me and I'm, I'm associated with a team. But at this time, you know, in eighth grade, Bobby Hurley's already considered great. Bobby Hurley Jr. in eighth grade was the only kid in the eighth grade that was shooting three-point shots and actually making them at a consistent level. And Jerry Walker was already big. He was like 6'6". Actually, on that team was Luther Wright. Luther's from five minutes walking distance from here. Okay. So you got to think about it. Like, Jerry Walker is five minutes from here, walking distance. So you got Jerry right here to the left. You got Luther right here to the right. I'm 10 minutes up the road, and Bobby Hurley is 20 minutes up the road. So if you stay on the same road, you can could, you could run into all of us. But it just so happened we're all at these different, uh, we're all in these different uh, grammar school teams. We're playing against each other. So it just so happened that we all ended up at St. Anthony's High School. But we're all from the neighborhood. So back then it wasn't a big You're thing. We're all in the same grade? We're all in the same grade. Same grade. Same grade. So we entered St. Anthony's in, ninth, uh, in 89. We in, we all freshmen in '89. At the time, uh, the only person that was really looked at as upon as a basketball player was Jerry Walker. He was six foot seven. He's the only player that ever started for St. Anthony's varsity team as a freshman, which was like unheard of. You know what I mean? Because of his size and his ability, and his ability. Seen as somebody who could further his career and where Bobby was a little dude so they think maybe he can't Bobby was a coach's son a little dude he, Bobby as a freshman played JV basketball okay I as a freshman played freshman basketball Jerry Walker played varsity and started as a freshman yeah so you can see where this is going yeah. right I only had one year as a starter at St. Anthony's it was a senior year crazy so that could tell you how the level of competition the, the caliber of players that we had, everyone before me was Division One guards. So coming up, you know, as a high school senior, I can remember at the Princeton camp, myself and Bobby Hurley, we were the two lightest people in the entire camp. I think we were, um, if I recall, I think that I was 153 pounds, Bobby was 100 and. 48 pounds. Bobby was a. I was 155. Bobby was 148. And I recall a, a guard, Trent Forbes, that went to Providence University. You remember from that area? He yeah. was about 146 pounds. Bobby was probably the lightest skin too. Yeah, Bobby was probably the lightest skin. Bobby was a great man. Let me tell you. A lot of people don't know Bobby Hurley played all basically all his basketball growing up in inner city neighborhoods. You know, it wasn't a time that Bobby wasn't the only white guy that was playing on a court with in the middle of 2,000 people. It wasn't like he was afraid or anything like you that. You could tell. He was a tough kid. You could tell watching him play. Yeah. And nobody yeah. looked at him the same way they looked at some of the other Duke guys. Right. You just looked at him differently. They're saying, like, we're probably going to be, like, the number one team in the country. And and what we would do is we will, we will get our five together. Myself, Bobby, Jerry Walker, we'll snatch two, and we would just go around the city, and we just show up at different parks, and we have well, we got next, and you know we'll play against grown men, we'll play against anyone, it didn't matter. We did the same thing, ball. <laughs> so that's what we did. We traveled all over the city and played. 
And in the matter, it, I don't know what happened, but it just seemed like in a matter of like a half an hour to an hour that we were there, without social media present then, it just seemed like everyone will flock to the courts. We'll get like three, two, three hundred people watching pickup games. And we just got there like 20 minutes ago. So we'll go in the middle of for Booker T projects. We'll be in Lafayette Guards projects. We'll be in Duncan projects. And our point guard always would be Bobby Hurley. They would try to go at Bobby. They would, they, they would do anything possible to show that he wasn't as good as they say he was. Now, he had us, myself, Jerry Walker, who was from the inner city. Bobby was comfortable coming to those areas. Who had a bigger impact on you at St. Anthony's, Bob Sr. or Bob Jr.? Because now, Bob Sr., he taught you a lot about the game and about life, I'm sure. But Bob Jr., you no. put the ball in your hand. No, Bob you Jr., buckets. now let me tell you something. Bob Jr. actually played a big role because he was always seen as one of the, either the number one point guard in his class or he was number two behind Kenny Anderson. But he was Archbishop Malloy. So either it was Bobby Hurley or it was Kenny Anderson who was the best point guard. So being that I never, no one knew who Terry DeHair was, I always watched Bob Hurley's movements. I watched how he worked. If I'm this close to this guy, he's the best. I'm not bad if I can emulate some of the things he does, which is worth ethic. And each and every day, I have a barometer of where I stand against someone who's considered the best. So that's basically that really drove me. Of course, Kurt Hurley was there with the technical stuff and, you know, the motivational stuff. But the discipline that's needed at that high school level. But it was knowing that Jerry Walker was there, All-American. It was Bobby Hurley's All-American. They're all over magazines. They're, They're ranked all over the place. I'm not ranked. And I'm seeing these guys on a daily basis. I'm working out with them on a daily basis. I can gauge my talent towards their talent. When did you realize you were going to be able to play professional ball? That's a great question because I never thought that I was going to be able to play professional ball. I always thought that if you said, Terry, you're going to play in the NBA, that would be like a joke. You know, that's, a, that's a joke on in the, in the neighborhood. That was a joke up until when? When I figured it out, I was a sophomore at Seton Hall. And I was leading the country in scoring in the NCAA tournament. I never thought I would, as a sophomore, lead the country in scoring in the NCAAs. That's like I'm averaging like 27, 28 points a game. And at that point, after that tournament happened, people started talking. Uh, media, newspaper outlets started talking and, and started like recognizing me as like one of the possible good guards in the country. And before that, <laughs> I never thought of it. Other than the NCAA tournament, and where we went to the, uh, we lost in the final eight to UNLV, and at, at, right after that game, that was that, that real UNLV. That was UNLV real. That was the the Anderson Hunt at the two, LJ. Greg Anthony, LJ, Stacy Augman, uh, Elmore Spencer, yep. uh, Shackles, Ackles, Ackles. Yeah, every last person we just named all played in the NBA. Yeah. All seven just played in the NBA. So Moses I'm, Scurry. Moses Scurry. And they were wild. Like they would they would have like fifteen dunks a game and they would scream on every dunk. It was wild. And we go into their game and you know, the uh, the late Jerry Tarkanian, he makes a comment like we have to stop the hair. And I'm like, stop the hair. I'm watching you guys on TV every night. Like, oh, my God, I'm scared of this. You know what I mean? Like, at the time, they had this thing called the Amoeba Defense. They played. And I was like, wow. They put Augment on you? Yeah, they put Augment on me. They had the Amoeba defense. Augment was 6'8", two, two, long, 210, <laughs> long arms. I think I had 13 points at the half. And I was like, man, I can play here. Like, I'm comfortable. I felt comfortable. It's the first time I felt comfortable in that type of setting. That type of competition. That comp- level of competition because these are the best. They were number one in the country the whole year for the last yeah, two years. Time. Prime time every night. Yeah. And I I mean, I played good in other big games, but I think that was the game that told me that all these guys that we knew were pros. And I was a sophomore, and they was actually worried about me. You know what I mean? So I kind of felt like, hey, this, I, I, this can work. I might can, uh, this can happen. So that's actually the point where I figured after that uh, loss to UNLV in, uh, in the grade eight as a sophomore that I could play in the NBA. So you went from 13 a game 
your senior year of high school to your freshman year at Seton Hall, 16 a game. How do you explain that? You go from a high school level competition, you're throwing in 13 a game. You move up to the Big East, and now you're throwing in 16 a game. I think that speaks to more the structure at St. Anthony's High School. You know what I mean? Like, they say that the only person that could hold Michael Jordan under 20 points is Dean Smith. I've heard that before. <laughs> I've heard that one. Well, That's a classic. Actually, Coach Hurley is pretty much from the same cloth. Okay, that explains it. Yeah, it's from the same cloth. You yeah. don't... We, Bobby Hurley as a perennial All-American, first-team All-American, averaged 19. Jerry Walker All-American averaged 16. Charity here averaged 12. You know what I mean? So... Actually, it was correct. In but it's more about the name on the front of the jersey than, than the in the back, back of the jersey. So you, we're doing we're, we're playing St. Anthony's way. It's, a, it's the way we play. It's not uh, wide open. You don't get to shoot three, four, five threes a game. So it was a little content. But in that, in averaging thirteen points a game in high school, it ha- it helped me be more efficient because it helped me understand that I could do more with less. I didn't come from a situation where in high school where guys average 28 points a game in high school, then they get to college, they average 10 points. You know what I mean? Because in high school, they had they had the ability to do whatever they wanted to do. You didn't need do. all that volume. I didn't need the volume to still accomplish. You didn't need all those accomplish. touches and all those shots to get your... Yeah, I, didn't, I never was accustomed to shots. I actually was able to get more shots as a college freshman than I did as a high school senior at St. Anthony. You played for a couple serious disciplinarians. You played for Bob Hurley Sr. and you played for P.J. Calissimo. They're both known for being no-nonsense, tough-as-nails coaches. Do you think your personality, you kind of needed that type of coach? You think you kind of fed off of that? Yeah, I actually, it's funny you say that, I actually needed that. I'm the kind of kid I knew growing up that I only excelled in classrooms where the teacher was a disciplinarian. I didn't excel where it was teachers where they kind of let you do and flow how you wanted to flow. I kind of like, uh, I took advantage of situations like that. They give you enough rope to hang yourself. And I always hung myself, yeah. you know what I mean? And 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 with, with, with Coach Hurley and, and Coach Qualissimo, they don't do that. It's a little different. It's more, you know, you're responsible for your actions and everything. Everyone's accountable. And I strive better in those atmospheres with a disciplinarian. How'd you end up at Seton Hall? Yeah, I'm, like you said, you weren't one of the, you weren't a McDonald's All-American. You weren't getting offered from everybody. Did you get other big offers? Yeah, I actually, uh, I got offered from Virginia. I got offered from North Carolina. I got offered from Rutgers. Those were my last, like, my final four schools. And uh, growing up as a kid in, in the metropolitan area, I always wanted to play the Big East. I always had a love for the Big East. I always had a love for Pearl Washington, watching him play Mark Jackson, you know, that St. John's team. So I always was, you know, I was peeking at the Big East, like, ah, that would be nice to play. Uh, Rutgers wasn't in the Big East at the time, or Atlantic 10. Uh, that's why I didn't really feel it. Uh, Virginia and North Carolina was in the ACC. Virginia was a great academic school at the time. It still is. And I thought about that. Then I thought about all the McDonald's All-Americans that were sitting on Dean Smith's bench. I'm home at Seton Hall in New Jersey. Uh, the politics will be on my side. A hometown kid stays home. I understood that at a young age. And I thought that the best fit for me, because I couldn't see myself living maybe in Virginia after my uh, college career was over. I don't know if I see myself living in North Carolina when it was over. I can see myself living in Jersey, New York area, but not Rutgers. You know what I mean? Because they weren't in the Big East. So that's how I actually came to the conclusion that Seton Hall, and mind you, Seton Hall was at everything I did that summer, every game, every, everywhere I was, I'd see a Seton Hall representative. So I knew there was a, a, a place that actually wanted me. So. I think it was an easy transition for me. You talked about wanting to play in the Big East. When I was growing up, the Big East was, that was it, man. That was it. Was, it. it was like the NBA. <laughs> and the Big, Big East. East. <laughs> and then the college basketball. College basketball. <laughs> the, the Big East was, was everything, especially if you were from the yeah, East Yeah, you knew it. You had to design 
an all-time Big East dream team, who are you putting on it? I'm talking about the real Big East, not like the Dougie McBuckets Big East. Wow. You got the Georgetowns and the Syracuse guys that you got to just like... I got to put yourself on it. Well, myself is definitely on it. Don't worry about that. Well, I got to go by the people that I seen and the people I was able to play against. Fair enough. Right? I know some people did some greater things, but my five. Derek Coleman. <laughs> Let me tell you one story. I was a freshman, and we were up in the carrier dome, and Derek Coleman gets a steal with like 12 seconds left to go in the game. He gets a steal. He goes down the court. He dunks the ball. It's six seconds left on the clock. Derek Coleman never turns around. He walks after he dunks the ball. He walks straight into the crowd and puts both his hands up and just looks at the crowd. <laughs> He's not even turning around and what's going on behind him. And I said to myself, I was like, wow, this guy's unbelievable. <laughs> this guy is serious. <laughs> like, another one, Billy Owens, same team. Holy Christ. He could do everything. He could do everything. Any position. Six he nine. In, in today's NBA. In today's NBA, he plays the point four. He does everything. He dunks on you. He shoots the three. And he was one of the guys that I was like, I marveled over like what he could do at that size. Now, as a freshman, I happened to witness to go down to the Capitol Center, Cap Center. They had a coach, John Thompson, down there at the time, right? This is about 1989. And I can remember that starting lineup like it was so. yesterday. It was in the backcourt, you had Mark Tillman and Dwayne Bryant. At the front court was Hall of Fame. You had Dikembe Mutombo at center. You had Alonzo Mourning at the four. And you had Sam Jefferson at the, at the three at 6'10". I was a freshman. And you know, in Big East back then, it wasn't like, you know, not today's day, where a kid averaged 17 points a game as a freshman and he votes for the NBA. You know, if that kid was good as a freshman, you had to deal with him for another three years. So it was going to be a pain in your tail for another three years. That's how the Big East was. So all the juniors and seniors in the Big East were basically pros that, you know, just waiting for the calendar That's to change. Cool. I can remember vividly, we were down in the Cap Center. And I see these big guys run out of the tunnel. And John Thompson, the last one out the tunnel with his towel on his shoulder. And I'm like, wow, this is real. Like, I'm in, I'm in the shit. <laughs> so I remember that day that, you know, it was some uh, older guys on the team, like some juniors and seniors on the team that played in the Final Four the year before at Seton Hall that had some experience. The first three minutes before the first TV timeout, we had three three-second violation calls on us, and we had the ball in the paint. So how could we have three three-second call violations and we're on offense, and we have the ball? You know what happened? Our bigs were pump faking so much. That's crazy. The first three plays were three second calls after look. Head fake, head fake, head. Like, I said to myself, you got 7 3, 6 11, 6 10 down there, and you have some pretty good guard defenders. We might not score today. Like, it felt like we could not score. Well, that day, Mark Tillman at the time lit me up as a freshman. He was a senior. He lit me up for like 29. Hit every jump shot, baseline jump shot I'm going to hit. I couldn't wait to get out of D.C. You've been Jersey famous probably for a little while because St. Anthony's brings you a certain amount of celebrity. And then Seton Hall brings you a certain amount of celebrity playing in the Big East. When did you start going places and people start recognizing you? And Well, actually, I, it was funny because it, uh, it was my rising senior year in college. I went to the bookstore. Seton Hall's bookstore, and I stopped at the magazine. And Street and Smith. Street and Smiths. I go to the magazine rack, and I see my face. <laughs> I see my face on the cover of Street and Smith. That's something. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm in a bookstore at Seton Hall. I'm a rising senior, and I see my face on the cover of Street and Smith. And I could recall of all the years I was picking up Street and Smith, Everybody on that cover was a bad dude. <laughs> I, I picked up that magazine every year. I'm going to wait for it to come out. I need to see that college basketball. I need to come out. Right. Exactly. And you know about it. Like, when you pick up the college basketball street, you know whoever grace that cover in that region is the dude. So 
I go to Pathmark, the Jersey grocery store now, and I see me on four different covers. So now I'm like in five covers in a week. And I'm like, holy shit, like a kid from Jersey City didn't even score a thousand points in high school, didn't even start on his high school team until he was a senior. It wasn't even a parade all American, wasn't even an all American in high school. Just three years later, I'm gracing a cover of National Basketball Magazine. Were you even all state in high school? I, I think I was all maybe second team honorable all state, mention honorable there. mention in state in yeah. high school. So I never I never got an accolade. I never was awarded anything. And at that point I wasn't. I mean I scored a lot of points at the time, but I never really held the trophy for a champion other than the Big East. So you won Big East? Player of the Year one time? Two times. One time. One time. No, I won Big East uh, Tournament MVP. Okay. And then I won Big East Player of the Year. Okay. All in the same year. Also but, an All-American. And also All-American. But coming into that year, who knew? They was just projecting. You know, oh, Terry's going to be the Player of the Year in the conference. I mean, it's easy to project that, but you got to go out and play that. You know what I mean? Means it means nothing. It means nothing. Everything happened the way it was supposed to play out. You know what I mean? Um, I think the best thing was my decision to go to Seton Hall. Seton University. Hall was a great fit for you. It was the best fit. Yeah. And the reason why, I, I looked at uh, John Morton. John Morton was the two guard at Seton Hall before I played. He went to the Final On that Four. Final Four team. Yeah. Final Four team. He had a great success. So, I mean, I was a little different as a kid where a coach could tell you, yeah, you could come into the school and you could do great things. And, you know, because of our offense, we run a certain offense. I never really listened to that. I always wanted to see the program of the, the, the team's media guide. That told me everything. You know, you, a coach could say, we're going to run X amount of plays for you. But, yeah, what is my position? What did they average last year as shot attempts? That's what I looked at. I looked at John Morton's shot attempts. And what I found out in his in his senior year, he was averaging about 12 shots a game. So I said to myself, I'm going to be replacing a guy that with this offense, he's averaging 12 shots a game. So when I looked at that, I said to myself, knowing my game and knowing John Morton's game, I said to myself, I could garnish another three out of the 12. So that means as a freshman, I could probably get 15 shots a game. I have not seen 15 shots a game in my life. In my life. <laughs> So I said, with that ratio, I might be all right. So I think knowing that, that John Moore took 12 shots a game, I didn't care what he averaged. It was what he got up to the rim. And if he could see 12, I said to myself, I could see 15. Some people could see 25. <laughs> I could get you that story another time. Like, and that's what made me go to Seton Hall. So you're coming out of Seton Hall. You're feeling good. You're confident. You just won Big East Player of the Year. You're an All-American, projected to go first round. How many teams do you work out for? I think I worked out for about maybe four or five teams at the time. I can recall Milwaukee Bucks had the seventh pick. I worked out for them. I worked out for the Clippers twice. Uh, they had the 13th pick. I worked out for Indiana. They had the 12th pick. Uh, the Nets at the time, they had the 16th pick. They didn't. They didn't work me out. They didn't think I was gonna be. What were you doing at your workouts? Were you were you working out with other guys? Or back then they didn't really have you do that. They just had you do your own thing. No, some teams had you know you came by yourself. I recall Milwaukee Bucks. I was by myself. When I was in Indiana Pacers, I was with another guy. You had to go one on one with them, or you just working through drills with them. We were just working through drills. It wasn't like you know one on one. It was basically like you know. Uh, dribble through these cones, shoot a jump shot. Then next, you go. You know what I mean? Something like that. And uh, I worked out for the Clippers in L.A. Uh, then they came to campus and worked me out there. And I had a like, I had a great workout with the Clippers. You know, I probably out of 200 jump shots, I probably missed like seven Damn. out of 200. So I felt good in my workouts. I was confident at the time. I'm coming off a Big East championship. We beat Syracuse by 40. Uh, I won the, the MVP of that, the MVP of the, uh, the conference. You beat Syracuse by 40? Yeah, that's in the Big East Championship in 93. You beat a Lawrence Moten team by 40? 40. Wow. Red Autry, they had a they had old That team was loaded. Mike Hopkins, who's a coach yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, loaded. Mike Hopkins. Guy. Yeah, he, yeah, he's 6'5 guy. Yeah, we beat him by 40. I think it was like 101 to 61. Conrad McCray still there? Yeah, they was wow. all there. <laughs> They remember the beating. <laughs> so, 
So where were you projected to go? I was projected anywhere from uh, seven to fifteen. Okay. In the draft. So you end up thirteenth. End up thirteenth to the Clippers. Yeah. Okay. Thirteenth. At the time, they had a uh, Ron Harper was under uh, contract negotiations, and I guess they they didn't know if he was going to come back or not. I was going to ask you about Ron Harper. Did you play with the pre knee injury Ron Harper? Or no, was this post, after? post. Oh, okay, because yeah. I've heard stories about him. Nah, pre- nah. I seen him pre. Real deal. Deal like Jordan. That's what I hear. Here. That's what I hear. Yeah, he was he was the deal. But you had some good vets. You had Mark Jackson. Mark Jackson. I had Danny, Danny Manning. Manning. Danny Manning was great. Mark Jackson so, was so great. Gary Grant. Gary Grant. He used to play up at the wellness with us at University of Miami. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which one of them kind of took you under his wing and showed you how to be a pro? I think more or less, I think Mark Jackson, Danny Manning took me under their wing and, 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 and basically explained the little things to me, little stuff that, you know, look out for, stuff that you should do, how to conduct your business. You know, Mark Aguirre came in also late. I know Mark. You know Mark? Yes. I love Mark. Great guy. Oh, I love Mark. Mark came in like maybe six months after I was a rookie, and then I bonded with Mark a little bit, and he showed me some, you know, stuff that you don't think about at age 21, stuff like how to, uh, restaurant stuff, how to do, how to act, and how to conduct yourself, and stuff like that, that I still remember to this day. First pick in the draft, 1980. <laughs> Mark what great guy, man. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you enough about him. I believe it was during your rookie year, Bobby Hurley. He got into that car accident. Mm-hmm. You remember where you were when you found out about that? Actually, yeah. We actually played Sacramento Kings that night. We were, uh, I was with the Clippers. Okay. We were up in Sacramento. We were playing yep. at the Arco Arena. Yep. It's like in the first month of our, our rookie careers. And I was excited, you know, playing against Bobby and, you know, being that we went to high That's school cool, and everything. Cool. And so I said to Bob, I was, you know, we were on the court and, you know, I was like, hey, man, you know, how's it going? You know, how's everything going? You know, after the game, you know, let's have a beer. You know what I mean? Like, I'll come, I'm going to come over to the locker room. Let's talk a little bit. He, he mentioned to me that he was feeling, you know, he was a perfectionist and he put a lot of extra pressure on himself to be the savior of Sacramento you know, being with his success in, in, you know, at Duke. So, you know, I said, ah, you know what, let's enjoy it, you know. We'll talk after after the game. So after the game, I, I went into the locker room, shout real quick, run over to his locker room to, to find out, you know, just to talk to him, have a beer maybe. Time I got over there, they said he left. And I was like, he left? But we just had a conversation that he's going to wait for me that, you know, we're going to talk. Like, where did he go? They said, oh, he, he was pissed off about something. He bolted. I was like, all right. So then I ended up just going, getting back on a bus with the Clippers, and then we flew back down to L.A. that night. It wasn't until about maybe 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. This is before cell phones. And- yeah, I, yeah, before cell phones, social media, anything. He said, hey, you know, Bobby was in a car accident. I was like, a car accident? What do you mean, car accident? We just played. Called? I want to say assistant coach. One of the assistant coaches. Whether I don't know if it was from Bobby's team or maybe my team. They called me and said that Bobby's in a car accident. And I was like, wow, I just left him. And, and But I'm not thinking that his car accident actually occurred on the arena grounds. You know what I mean? Because remember, I was waiting for him to have a discussion with him after the game. But he bolted because he was pissed. And it might have happened right around then. It happened right around then because there's no lights. So I guess the car that hit him didn't have his lights on, and he didn't see him. And Bob was like, he, he fell into a ditch with a little water in it and stuff. But one of our good friends, Mike Popowski, who actually was on the team at the time, had me driving the same route that Bobby would drive and actually seen Bobby car in the ditch. And, you know, pulls over the side of the road and just sees Bobby laying face in the ditch and just picks him out. And that's basically what saved him. Like, wow. if this is a night, it's dark. Like, if he decides, like, he Drive goes by. right instead of left, Bob's dead in the, in the ditch overnight. Uh-huh. So it was like grace of God that this guy even found him. Right. So was it disappointing to go to the Clippers knowing their history? Well, see, at that time, you know what? I wasn't so really just happy to get drafted. Exactly. Okay. I'm happy that the NBA has called. And it you didn't, a guaranteed contract. It didn't matter who called. Okay. I'm showing up. You give me the basketball. We're going to play that day. 
that's what I thought about. I never really, I wasn't a seven footer. I wasn't this big dominant player where I could call my shots and say, you know what? I don't want the Clippers to draft me. If they draft me, I'm going to Europe. I'm 6'4, 195 pounds. You know what I mean? I can't make those type of calls, you know? If you call me, I'm, I'm playing. You know what I mean? I played JV as a sophomore. You think, I played right? JV as a sophomore. You think I care about who the hell? You know, you always think that you're going to be an agent of change. I know how I live, I know how I work. I know what I've been through. I know I've won other places. I know I could win. I know what it takes to win. So if the Clippers hasn't won, I'm not afraid. We're going to win. You know what I mean? It's, that's what I do. Wherever I go, we win. So that's my mindset. And But it's a, it's disheartening sometimes when you get to these pro teams and the culture. You know what I'm saying? Like for St. Anthony's, I may have lost two games in four years. I may have lost 15 games in four years at Seton Hall, may have 15 losses. I lose 12 games in a month. I mean, I start off my career 0-15. You guys were 0-15? 0-15. We're, we're, you got all those vets? 0-15. So we're looking at breaking a record 0-16. You had at no time, we had some injuries. You got no bigs, right? We had no bigs because they got injured. So we're looking to break the record. So when we're losing, the locker room wasn't sad. The locker room wasn't in disarray. Yeah. The locker room, no one threw a chair. You know what I mean? So it was a whole different culture where I came from where if we ever lost a game at St. Anthony, it was like, you know, the city shut down for a day. Like, it was nothing to lose a game. It was not a big deal. Like, <laughs> life goes on. <laughs> so what was it like playing for a Donald Sterling-owned team? Was he even present back then? Did you have run-ins with him? Were you guys aware of his? Yeah, no, he had he had presence. He was present around. He would come to all the home games. You know, we we would we would know he'll have his security, his bodyguard, his wife with him. He he would always be a, a mainstay at the games. You would see him. Oh, he did a Christmas party or something like that. You would see him. You know, he was he was around. No issues though. No issues. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that crazy racism that no, came the, out later. But what I did, it wasn't racism. I didn't see anything from him that said that that would that would make me think that. But what I did notice that, but I remember saying to myself as a uh, as a, a young kid, you know, 21 years old, I never been to the West Coast in my life, never been to LA. I get drafted by the LA Clippers. I'm in this beautiful place, you know. Uh, Donald Stern's owner of the team. He owns half of Beverly Hills, and we had a Christmas party. And at the Christmas party, we all had plastic knives and forks. And I said to myself, I'm like, this is California. We're in Beverly Hills. He owns half of Beverly Hills. I personally, who I'm broke, and I don't even, uh, at my home, I don't even eat with plastic knives and forks. So I kind of find it kind of strange that why are we eating with plastics at a Christmas party? Something right here. Yeah. Didn't pass the sniff test. <laughs> yeah, I did pass the sniff test. <laughs> you were in your situation in, with the Clippers where you guys are losing. You're probably not having the rookie year that you envisioned. Is there another player out there, other players in the league you're watching kind of get off? And you're thinking, man, if I was, it's all about opportunity. It's all yeah. about where you land, <clears throat> the, the situation. It makes and breaks careers. It makes and breaks careers. And people don't understand that. One thing is to get to the league. Yes, we understand that. But the next thing is to fall into a situation that benefits you and your talents and your abilities. Right? Let's take, for instance, my career. Let's be clear. I shoot the ball. I shoot it well. I shoot it better than a lot of people and most. That's a fact. That's a fact. We don't need to check that. That's you, a fact. I could check that box. Okay? But now, it depends on the team you get drafted to. Now, if I get drafted to, let's say, uh, Houston Rockets, I get drafted to the New York Knicks, I get drafted to the Utah Jazz, I get drafted to a team that has a dominant big man, low post presence, a low post presence that then causes doubles, that causes doubles, kick outs to Terry, kick outs to Terry, he's open. I will probably play another 15 years in the league. But now let's take this Clippers situation. At the time, we're dealing with. As my rookie year, with all the injuries, I'm dealing with a 6'8 post player that's on a 10-day contract from the CBA, which is Bo Outlaw. Outlaw. <laughs> so now, I'm dealing with an undrafted free agent 
6'8 center in the 90s. Where, if you didn't have a 7 footer. You might be able to get away with that now. Now. Back but back then, then if you no didn't have shot. a 7 footer, you had no shot. No shot. So, what I would Colleges like to say. Colleges weren't even doing that back then. No. So, what I like to say to a lot of people is that, hey, think about it. If I played with Shaq, I could have did what Derek Fisher did. For 10, 20 years. Nick Anderson. Nick Anderson. Dennis like, Scott. Dennis Scott. Like, if they went to places where they had to create their own shot to be successful, a lot of those players wouldn't have panned out the way they planned out. Speaking of that, Bill Fitch, was he your first coach? Bill, Bob Weiss. Was it Bill Fitch or Bob White? Bob Weiss was my first coach, then okay. Bill Fitch. Okay. Yeah. Try to make you a point guard? Yeah. You well, never played point guard your whole life? I never played point guard my whole life. And why would they think the NBA is a good place to start? I don't know. I guess they was trying to experiment because all my life I always had like a good point guard around me. Even in grammar school, the great David Rivers, he had a younger brother named Jermaine Rivers who died suddenly in the South Point High School for brain cancer. Wow. So he was a 6'2", 170 pound freshman point guard at the time. He got ill. So I always had a point guard next to me. Then I had Bobby Hurley next to me. Then I had Brian Cave. I had Oliver Taylor. So I never had to handle the ball at all. I My game plan was basically two or three dribbles and do what I had to do. But when I got to the Clippers, I guess they felt that with my size and my shooting ability, I could probably take advantage of some of the smaller point guards in in, in the league. So they experimented with that. Not that that was my thing because I was always a shoot first, pass second, and third. Yeah. <laughs> so back, I believe it was the late 90s. It could have been the early 2000s. I'm sitting at home watching ESPN2. You're not Googling everything. You know, you kind of just watch basketball back in the early 90s. And then you have some favorite players, people right. like Terry DeHair and Lawrence Moten. Right. These guys, and you wonder, what happened to that guy? I'm watching ESPN2, and I see Terry DeHair riding a bus <laughs> on some show about the D-League. Is this true? Like, I've never yes. I've never researched this. I've never spoken to you about it. You were in the D-League, and you were on this bus with all these kids. They were kids, and you were the only grown man, <laughs> and they were doing a reality show about this team. That was funny, because that was one of the first reality shows right. that actually hit it was like back in 2001 okay 01 2001 my senior year of college 2001 yeah and how that came about is i uh in 2000 i went overseas i went and played in germany for alba basketball team which is a part of euroleague one of the main teams in germany and they called me they wanted me to play for the euroleague tournament so they they hired my services for about for, for five months from january to may so in 2000, you know, I left the NBA at the time. At that time, uh, I, w I was in Indiana Pacers. It was my last uh, stint with the NBA. I went to in uh, the, the, the year that they went to the, the finals. Yep. I was in that camp. And they found that my hip, I had an arthritic hip in camp. So I didn't make the team. I couldn't sign with any of the team as a free agent because... You had trouble passing the physical? Yeah, I had trouble passing the physical. So at that point, I said, hey, I, I'm not done playing. I'll go overseas. We won the championship. We did everything. I averaged, I, I did very well over there. So I came back. I was really content on being there. You know, that was it. One of my friends who does community service in my neighborhood in Jersey City, where I grew up, she, I wasn't doing anything. And she says to me, uh, would you like to accompany me and the kids? Because she used to uh, mentor these young kids that used to box. So she says, hey, we have an awards dinner tonight. Would you like to come? You know, it was at the Robert Tree Hotel in Newark. New Jersey, so I show up there, I go to the bathroom. I run into Rory Sparrow. <laughs> oh, Nick's boy, <laughs> point guard Rory Sparrow. So he says, he said, hey man, what are you doing? Why are you not playing? You look good, like you should be playing. I said, I don't know, I don't think, uh, you know, I just came overseas, I didn't get a call, so I don't want to go back overseas, you know, Chasing a dream. This is seven, eight years into your career, maybe? Yeah, yeah, this is about eight years in. This is about to be 2001, 2002 at the point. So he says, you want to play? I thought about it for a second. I said, we got mine. Sure. He said, well, you know, Alex English, 
is coaching down in uh, Charleston, the Low Gators. He might could use you. So I said, Low Gators, D-League. And this is actually the inaugural season of the D-League. That's right. That's why they had the reality show. They had the reality shows. When I got down there, it's not that I found out that they were actually being followed by ESPN, the show. So that's how it all happened. So what made you run for office? I served one term. Uh, basically what happened, I got into politics. You don't strike me as a politician. No, I'm, a, I'm really good at it. You know? <laughs> I'm really good. I really, I'm so good they're afraid of me. That's how good I am. <laughs> I heard. So I started dealing at that time in real estate. And me being from Jersey City, there was a lot of abandoned buildings. And I always thought that, why don't you just fix them up? So it's then when I had, at the time, early 90s, when I had money, you know, where I said, all right, I want to buy a building, I want to fix it up, I want to do these things, I want to make it look nice, I want to bring my city back, I'll, you know, be proud of where I live. It wasn't that easy. And I had money. And I always wanted to know, if I have money, why wouldn't they allow me to fix up dilapidated buildings? Why is that? That doesn't make sense to me if it's been abandoned for over 15 years. You would applaud or embrace someone that wants to do something like that. And that is what the initial uh, fire that came into politics. So tell me about the nonprofit Jersey City Community Housing Corp. We build and develop um, affordable housing for low to very low income producing families in in area median basically what in english <laughs> basically what that says is like you take the average of the income in the area and basically we we, we come to a, a a price point where it's affordable based on the averages okay. and also what we do is we create housing for the 55 and older community also which is through the non-for-profit entity where we we partner with state entities and, and municipalities to create these uh units within their uh town all right, we're going to do a, a little quick fire session here. Just a few questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Who's the toughest matchup for you in college and then in pros? Like, who, when you saw them on the schedule, like, I'm in for a fight tonight. Like, who did you have a, have a thing with? I think, I think one of, uh, in, in, the, in the pros, in the pros, I would say it was Mitch Richmond. Mitch Richmond was one of those players that you knew that, it's gonna be a long night if you don't if, if you don't pay attention to detail. Mitch was one of the people that he was big, he was strong, but he had a feathery touch, so he could shoot the ball. So it's either you could take his punishment, or you could concede to the punishment, and he's still gonna get you the twenty for J. So it was like pick your poison with him, and he had the body, he had the master to withstand the, the rigorous schedules and stuff like that. So Mitch was one of those people. One of the other people I would say was like Ricky Pierce. I hear that all the time. I hear that all the time. You heard Ricky he will, Pierce? Yes. He will post you up. Man. He'll take you outside. I got a story for you. <laughs> I got a good story. We're playing up in, uh, I think we're in Golden State. We're in Golden State. We're the Clippers. Myself and the late Malik Seeley. We're in the backcourt together. We're both from, you know, he went to St. John's. I yep. went to Seton Hall. Yep. So we're in the game together in the backcourt for the Clippers. And the Golden State backcourt that's coming in the game is Latrell Sprewell and Ricky Pierce. Ricky Pierce. They're in the backcourt. So, you know, we're coming in, like, from the uh, the benches, and we're, we're passing the scores table. So the league Sealy says, yo, T, who you want? So I look at I look at Ricky Pierce and I look at Latrell Sprewell and I say, "Give me Ricky, right?" I think Ricky heard me. <laughs> <laughs> it's never good to, it's never for good. Them to hear that. The reason why I said Ricky because Latrell was a little taller. He was about six six, six seven. He was fast. He was very athletic. He was he was like younger too. He was like just running up and down the court. Ricky Pierce, I figured that you know he's six four, a little stout. Not as fast. I could control him a little better. I like don't have to run as much. I don't have to run as much. I got this. It's Malik six Not eight. Not gonna put me on a poster. Not gonna do me <laughs> on a poster. All right. So I feel good about the matchup. So I tell Malik, I said I got Ricky. Let me tell you something. After three plays, I begged for Spreewell. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you the three next possessions. Foul, 
N1, N1, and my lip is busted. Ooh. And I'm on defense. <laughs> I went to half court. I whispered to Malik Ear. I said, listen, please give me spree well. I'm not playing Ricky Pierce no more. <laughs> it is no way I'm playing him. He was throwing elbows. He was he he had a move where he would shoot it and elbow you at the same time and make the layup. I said, I'm not doing that. I said, I told Malik at half court, I said, I would chase Spreewell outside. <laughs> I'm not playing Ricky Pierce no more. That's it. You're going to learn today. Yeah, I learned <laughs> quick. Stay away from Ricky. What about college? You got anybody in college that you kind of had a little rivalry with? You know, it's funny that I ain't really had a lot of rivals in college because I pretty much killed everybody. I seen, but, but I, 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 it's no player that I seen in college in four years that I say he got at me and I couldn't do nothing. You know what I mean? Everybody that seen me in four years in college, they'll tell you that I killed all of them. And nobody could hold you back. Nobody in college could hold me. That 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 wasn't a problem. That that didn't happen. I even played against as a freshman. I played against a great Oklahoma team with Skeeter Henrys and all of them, and I had over thirty points in that game. So that wasn't a thing, but. There was one player that gave me problems that I never seen coming. He wasn't big. He wasn't fast. He wasn't athletic. He was always there. Like, any move I made, like, Jason Buchanan. Okay. You remember yeah. that little skinny guy? Yes. He made me work. I never feared anyone outscoring me in a game like oh, I gotta score points cause he gonna outscore me I knew I'd get enough attempts at the end I'd weigh you down and nothing you could do but he was the one guy that didn't have a lot of attempts on offense and he concentrated just on limiting my touches he can put all his effort into that end that end and that was the one guy have you ever dated anybody famous and when I say dated I use the term loosely I'm gonna tell you this I was in LA in the early 90s there you go that's what so, I'm getting at. All right. Because so, I know it wasn't happening at Seton Hall. <laughs> I mean, or Vancouver Grizzlies. It wasn't happening there. All I'm going to tell you is, in 1993, I'm in California at age 21, and I got about $10,000 in my pocket on a daily. I had some fun. <laughs> Next question. I know what that answer means. Try and keep up with me now. I got you. Have you ever met Tommy Heinsohn? Yes. Tommy Heinsohn, for those who don't know, is also a Jersey City native. He is Mr. Celtic. Yes, sir. And I am uh, Mr. Junior Celtic. So okay. tell me your Tommy Heinsohn story. He was also my dad's favorite player as a kid. Okay, I never seen Tommy Heinsohn play, but his voice put up numbers. Tommy Heinsohn put up numbers. Twenty and twenty in playoff games. Thirty and twenty. What? On championship teams. Gosh, I never knew that. Hook shots from the corner. <laughs> <laughs> see, <clears throat> see how I know Tommy Heinsohn's voice, and I know him is because growing up in the in, in the Big East era. His voice was synonymous with Big East basketball. Mike Gorman and Mike Tommy Gorman Heinsen. and Tommy Heinsohn during the game. Big East Sports Channel. Sports Channel, you know. So basically when we went up to the, the Boston up in that area, Mike Gorman and Tommy Heinsohn would always be there in the Big East. So it's not until when I got to the NBA and I started playing with the Clippers and we visited uh, the Celtics. Then you'll see Tommy Heinsohn again, and then he'll call me over, and we have little talks, conversations, and stuff like that. I remember me going up into uh, Boston Garden, and uh, I, I guess I went to the basket one time, and I got fouled. And uh, the, the ref said, uh, 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 non-shooting. And I was really loud, right? I, I like, you know, I'm walking by the scores table. I said, come on, ref. You know I don't pass the ball. How can that be not? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I yelled to him, like, you know what? So true. You know what I'm saying? How can that be on the pass? You know I don't pass the ball, and it went like viral. Like if this was like today's media, yeah, it'd yeah, have been yeah. viral. But the USA but Today, the mic picked it up. The mic picked it up, and the next day was like on USA Today, like the quarter of the day, like 
to hear says, how dare it could be on the past. I don't even pass. Like, like, that was like a big thing. Like, that was funny. Like, That's and that was in Tom, that was in Tom Heinz was actually sitting there at the time yeah. when it happened. No, he's still sitting there. He's still there. Oh, yeah. He's he doing does, games? He does all the home games. Just he doesn't home. travel. Oh, he don't travel. All right. Scalabrini travels. <laughs> he's the color guy on the road. Scalabrini? Yep. White Mamba. <laughs> White Mamba. Well, that's good. He, he's good for him. Yep. full of that. All right, we're going to stay in Jersey City. You ever seen Beetlejuice around? Oh, yeah. Beetlejuice. I know Beetlejuice, man, back in grammar school. Yeah, yeah. Beetlejuice, the Howard Stern character. I know Beetlejuice, man, probably as a teenager, growing up 10, 11 years old. Beetlejuice uh, family. He has, like, brothers and sisters. And uh, we used to all go to a local swimming pool. You know, back in like I'm talking about like '85. Oh, you got any videos? Oh my God! <laughs> the funniest thing is that Beetlejuice family, all of them are small. Like they all are like small. They like, look like him though. They all look like him. They all look alike. Like it's a family of the Beetlejuice. It's not just like one <laughs> Beetlejuice. It's like three of them or four of them Beetlejuice. So we used to always see them coming to the pool. So they used to always come to the pool as kids, and they was uh. They was from Park Street. We used to call it the you know, Park Street area, which is like around the corner of the pool. Like, we knew. But Howard Stern is where he got the name Beetlejuice. His we name knew Lester, right? Lester. Yeah. We knew him as Lester, like little Lester. That was his name. Your like, age? Yeah, Lester's a little older than me. Okay. Lester probably maybe about his 50s Can't now. Can't tell how old he is. No you, offense. No one knows how old Lester is. When Lester was 25, they thought he was three. You know what I mean? You, you can't really tell. No idea. But his sister, his family, all of them, you know, if you see a, a Lester. Hilarious. Hilarious. Like, people would rob you while you were in a pool. It was like a whole <laughs> It was like a whole thing. That, like, the only pool in the hood. Any yeah. interest in midget balling? <laughs> no. I didn't say with him. No. You see, they, they rent him out to bowl him. Bowl him? Yes. I they never throw him it. down a bowling alley into the pin. <laughs> That's what he does. That's how he makes money. Right now? Yeah. I didn't see that. <laughs> Come on, man. Howard Stern really blew him up. If you were on death row, you could eat any meal. What would you ask for? Man, I think I might Oxtails. go with... Oxtails. No, I'm, I can't eat meat. I'm going to have to go with a chicken or fish. It's going to be a Chilean sea bass. Uh, probably with a nice uh, open baked potato. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do asparagus, mashed potato, and a chili and sea bass. A nice Pinot Grigio on the side. There you go. All I can right. take you know, I can take nice. a nice white. Yeah. Who's the craziest teammate you ever had? Nice, Elmore Spencer. Elmore Spencer, you on LV? The best, craziest teammate ever. This teammate never went into the locker room. After the game, he's just out. He's out. After practice, before practice, gone. gone. He would come in. <laughs> this is how crazy he was. He was about guy. He would come into practice just like he was in high school with his practice shorts and his practice uh, stuff under his clothes. He would take <laughs> off his jacket and his shirt, his sweats on his shirt. He would practice. Would he wear his kicks, his hoop kicks? Or yeah. Would he change no. the shoes and everything. He wear his hoop kicks with what he got on. He takes his stuff or he comes into the arena, he sits on the bench, he changes right there. <laughs> he then walks on the court after practice, he walks over to the bench, he puts back on his clothes over his uh, stuff, and he goes home. He never comes into the locker room. Only time he came into the locker room was like on game day. He had an MPV, an MPV with no hubcaps. <laughs> No, he had an MP. So he's like eccentric. He's ex very eccentric. Okay, and he's very aware of it. Very aware of it. Okay. One of the smartest people you will ever speak to, right? He has an MPV with no, uh, no uh, hubcaps. So <laughs> we had a game against the Lakers at the time, and you know Shaq is, of course, you know Shaquille O'Neal, and we beat Shaq and the Lakers this game, and Elmore Spencer goes for like twenty six points and like six rebounds, right? Shaq has a bad game. We win the game. So we play Shaq and them uh, Lakers in like three weeks. So the, the whole story is the Clippers got a new big man that dominated Shaq. And he doesn't even, he's not like Shaq. He doesn't buy uh, expensive cars. He's not into this whole, you know, this material world. He, he has an MPV with no hubcaps. He doesn't even go into the locker room. He's like, you know, he's very basic. And this was the whole, you know, talk in L.A. Yeah. back in like 93, like 94. So 
it lasted about three weeks because, you know, of course, Shaq is hearing the same stuff that, you know, we're hearing. So we're playing in uh, the forum. Now we're going into Shaq world. Shaq 40 and 20. Uh, we're going into Shaq world. So now all this build up into the two big centers, one from L.A., one from, you know, he got the best of Shaq the last time we're playing. So Elmore Spencer says he don't feel good tonight. He might not go. <laughs> So, the I most, retire after that game too. The funniest thing ever. He tried to retire after the game. <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal comes to the trainer, our trainer, and asks the question: What's wrong with Elmore Spencer tonight? <laughs> Why can't he go tonight? So they said, Oh, we think he has some plantar fasciitis. And blah, blah. Shaq wasn't buying none of it. Yeah. Shaq said, I need him to play tonight. <laughs> Not tomorrow, but tonight. <laughs> Too much talk about this center matchup. He ain't getting away from this one. Wow. And exactly what you said, Elmo Spencer played. He did play. He went He went for two points and three rebounds. Shaq had 40 and 20. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, but I didn't know. You knew what you didn't know. Yep. Shaq went for 40 and 20. Do, barbecue chicken. Barbecue chicken. <laughs> he did not let that guy off the hook at all. And and, and that was that was one of the, the moments I remember Shaq looking at the trainer like, it's no way that you're going to tell me that this guy's not playing tonight. <laughs> all right, give me your top five. Oh, easy, easy. I could give you that easy. I'm going to go with not in no particular order. I'm going to just go with it. Yeah, no order. No, no order. order, no order. You got to give the the, the, the fella, you got to go Pac. You got to go Nas. You got to go Biggie. You got to go Jay. And I'm going to give you one more. I got to say Coogee Rap. That's hard to argue with that group. <laughs> but Coogee Rap doesn't get the... The acclaim, the rest. Nah, of he don't get the acclaim that get. But I guess a lot of their styles and a lot of the stuff they based on was his his his, uh, his rap style and how he. Yeah, Jay Z say he patented a lot of his stuff after him. Yeah, so, I like that list. <laughs> we can close this out, but you gotta promise to come back, or I'll come back up here sometime. Oh, that's not a problem, man. I don't have no problem coming to Miami either. Let's do that. <laughs> come sure. on down. No doubt. Thanks, man. All right, man. All right, peace. So I gotta keep it a hundo. That sound quality sucked. Keep it 100. I apologize. Thank you to everybody who stayed with it despite the sound adversity. And listen to episode two of Keeping It A Hundo. Please make sure you download and subscribe to Keeping It A Hundo. You can find episodes of Keeping It A Hundo on the Apple Podcast app. You can also find me on Instagram at Matty Hundo. Next week, I'll be talking to my boy, Oakland Raiders quarterback, 